Welcome to the dark stream, Vox Day, voxday.blogspot.com, and unauthorized.tv. Hopefully we don't have too extreme a close-up. Uh, actually, we do have a bit, so let me try to back it up a bit here. Other way, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Extreme close-up. So, tonight we're going to explain a few things and set a few things straight for the record. Um, and we're not going to talk about this big explosion in uh, Lebanon because I don't know a single thing about it. And I see absolutely no point in speculating about, uh, about things I know nothing about. Uh, <laughs> Someone, someone has some exclamation points. You're a bass player? Um, I think that would be a very sad exaggeration to describe myself as a bass player. Um, I have, on occasion, played bass um, very, very badly. Um, but I have played bass uh, even at... Uh, First Avenue, uh, the, the stage that uh, you know from Purple Rain. Um, I, there's, a, there's a line in Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, where someone asks Oz uh, if it's hard to play the guitar. <laughs> and he said, not the way I play it. And I think that that is uh, a good description. Um, so... You know, um, you'll you'll understand uh, why I got the bass uh, probably in in a few months, um, but it's um, it, it's more of a let's say it's more of a a support for my friends who are actually very good at um, at various instruments and so forth. Uh, we had a theory actually. <laughs> Back, back in my psychosonic days, which was that uh, the reason that the bass player is almost always the coolest individual in the band is because he's the one that everybody in the band likes and wants to be in the band, but he doesn't do anything. And so, um, so anyhow, uh, so that you know the, the guys who are the good musicians are like hey we can teach Johnny how to play the bass <laughs> and so anyhow it's fun it, it keeps um, you know keeps it, it, it allows me to um, be in the conversation with some of my friends let's let's put it that way so anyhow um, enough about that. Uh, let's talk about the uh, title, which is uh, Patreon is not going bankrupt. And it was kind of an interesting thing to say in terms of, uh, there's, a, there's a statement from Patreon that came out and I'll, uh, I'll bring it up here in a second. But um, it's, it's pretty funny and it reminded more than a few of us of the statement by Michaela Peterson when it was when she finally came out and said, uh, "Hey, the reason my dad hasn't been around for a long time uh, is because he's in a in treatment for uh, a drug addiction in Russia, uh, and, and and it's not meth <laughs> or whatever it was that she said." And it was kind of funny because everyone's reaction was, "Wait." Jordan Peters, who, why are you denying that he's addicted to meth? <laughs> you know. So anyhow, that's kind of become a, a catchphrase in the dread ilk and the and and the bear, the social galactic community is definitely not meth. You know, <laughs> whatever it is, it's definitely not meth. And so, uh, with Patreon, it was. Uh, Interesting to see how they come out with the same thing. We're definitely not going bankrupt. 
um, why are you talking about it? You know, and so uh, let's 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 read the whole statement as long as we're talking about it here. We've heard some things, some concerns about the recent decision in the lawsuit we filed, and wanted to clarify some things. First of all, there's nothing to worry about overall. Litigation is an unfortunate fact of business of doing business, and Patreon deals with a lot of it, the same as any other platform. Specifically, in this situation, we filed a lawsuit to bring some frivolous arbitrations into court because these claims should be decided in court under our terms of use. We're going to get to that. Unfortunately, the judge denied our preliminary injunction against those claims proceeding in arbitrations, so we'll now deal with these in arbitrations while we proceed with the next stage of the lawsuit. It seems that some of the people who are involved in organizing these arbitrations are reporting that we are going bankrupt as a result of these claims. Um, I haven't heard anybody uh, actually say that they're going bankrupt. <laughs> you know, the, I, a lot of people have said that they can see how that could lead to it eventually, but you know, anyhow, um, I can assure you that this is not true and appears that they are making those claims to try to keep up morale on their side and convince more people to bring claims against Patreon. Well, you know, first of all, the irony of this statement, and, and this is another example of SJWs always project, this statement was actually given to a woman who was worried about Patreon. So this statement is actually intended to convince Patreon creators and patrons that everything's fine. Don't worry about it. There's nothing to worry about. It's, a, it's something that is, is being done to try to keep up morale on their side. There's no need to keep up any morale on the anti-Patreon side. Not a single bear backed down when Patreon sued them. Very, very much to Patreon's uh, uh, anticipations. You know, the whole, the whole point, here's the thing that people don't necessarily understand and wouldn't have any reason to understand, is that that whole lawsuit was fundamentally intended as a bluff. I very, very much doubt that they thought for a minute that the Bears were willing to fight out the lawsuit. They genuinely thought that going to court was a magic uh, get out of jail free card. And it's not. Why not? Because their case is absolutely hopeless. I mean, the the preliminary injunction isn't that big a deal, except for the fact that it means that all of the 72 arbitrations, plus the other, whatever it is, uh, 19 arbitrations, that are the original ones, are going to proceed. So what? You know, there's literally dozens, before long, and maybe hundreds of other arbitrations that are going to be hitting them anyhow. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't really have mattered that much if they got the lawsuit to stay the arbitrations. And so, um, but what is true is that Patreon isn't going to go bankrupt anytime soon, even though they lose money every month. And the reason is that they have been given something on the order of 165 million dollars in investment money. Now what's interesting about that is that they actually managed to blow through over a hundred million dollars since they first got started in I think 2014. They needed to raise uh, additional money last year and they raised an additional 60 million. So Starting in January, they had it. Or sorry, starting in July 2019, they had at least 60 million dollars. 
Now they're not bleeding tons of money. They're losing somewhere between a million and a million and a half dollars um, a month. And, and keep in mind, this is normal. This is the way Silicon Valley works. Silicon Valley companies very, very seldom make money. Some of them still don't even make money. Twitter has never made any money. Facebook finally did get to the point where it made money and now it's extremely profitable. Same with Google. And so the it's not a big deal that they lose money every month. But what is a big deal is that they need to kind of keep on this curve. You know, the Silicon Valley wants a curve that looks kind of like this. You know, um, because that's what gets the the initial public offerings, or it what gets gets the uh, the big mergers and acquisitions. That's how people cash out. So that, that and that's that's how the investors make their money. So that's what everybody in Silicon Valley is attempting to do. And you know. I personally don't think it's a very good way to do business, but it is a way for people to make a lot of money in a hurry. So obviously it's popular and it'll continue to be popular. The problem of course, is that if you get caught up in stuff like this, if you get caught up in legal disputes and that sort of thing, um, that tends to have a negative impact on your ability to become a what they call a unicorn, you know, a, a billion dollar company, a company that has a, is valued at over a billion dollars and more investors give you lots and lots of money, right? So anyhow, um, I would assume that that is the real concern is the way that um, getting caught up in this kind of nonsense um, you know, tends to distract things from that launch path to um, unicorn status. That's the real issue. It's not. It's not uh, whether they go bankrupt or not. Because what's going to happen? I mean, all these companies are going to go bankrupt if they don't. Um, you know, if they don't launch successfully. You know, either you become uh, a successful going concern like Facebook or Google or whatever, or you go the way of pets.com, you spend all your money on a whole bunch of employees and fancy headquarters and television ads and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's really funny. You can often tell when a company has gotten funded because you suddenly start seeing television commercials all the time with the same you know stupid little name uh, for example in England uh, Kate Middleton's brother uh, was pitching a company or owned a company was pitching a company that allowed you to put your picture on marshmallows I think it was called Boomf or something like that horrible name but for a brief period of time maybe a year, year and a half, that commercial was on English television incessantly. Why? Because they'd gotten the money from their investors and they had a certain amount of time to spend a lot of money and try to get all of the users, um, you know, get to get it, get, you know, collect the eyeballs as they used to call it. And so that didn't work. And so they had actually what they, I think the company might still be around, but they completely uh, changed the, the focus of it. And I think they actually found something that worked, but you never see tele television commercials anymore. They're not spending their money on that stuff. Um, but you know, if you watch carefully when you, when you see a commercial, when you, when you see something like some sort of new name you've never heard before, and you, you see the commercials repetitive and so forth, um, then 
what you, know, you usually know that they're spending the investment money and they're trying to ramp up they're trying to launch and um, yeah they, they don't they don't worry about profit because remember this is a fundamentally a debt-based economy and so you know uh, the whole idea of simply making a pro making product uh, selling it at a reasonable profit margin and building up slowly that way is something that um, is something that they don't um, they don't do anymore. It's not of any interest to them. So anyhow, um, <laughs> faces on marshmallows. Yeah. So, um, but the problem with related to, to the arbitrations are is that nobody has. <laughs> Nobody who's talking about this, in, in, from Patreon to um, Cernovich or anybody else, no one has any idea what they're talking about. You know, e even the lawyers don't know, because very few of them have ever been involved in a consumer arbitration before. So let me explain a little bit about how these things work, and also, uh, you know, some people have been pointing out that. Oh well, you know, you're not talking about. You're only talking about Owen's arbitration. You're not talking about this arbitration. You're not talking about that arbitration, and so forth. No, I'm only talking about Owen's arbitration, or the or the Bears, because the Bears situation is public, and Owen's arbitration. Well, I've got permission from Owen to talk about it. I don't talk about any other arbitrations. And there are other arbitrations. Some of them go well, some of them don't go well, but I don't talk about them because I don't have permission to do so. And in some cases, I know nothing about it. You know, I can only talk about the situations that I've been informed of by the people who are involved. So, uh, but here's something that is very, very important to understand, and it's it's very clear that most people don't understand this at all. There is absolutely no connection, none whatsoever, between one arbitration and another one, even if everything is exactly the same. So what that means is that it is incredibly difficult to anticipate what is going to happen in one arbitration based on what happened in another arbitration. Now keep in mind, there are over 200 arbitrations going on right now, around there. So, Obviously, we see and we know that there are different results and different decisions happening all the time, every single day. You know, you can lay the exact same facts before one arbitrator and they will decide that, um, they will decide that Party A is completely in the wrong. And then you can lay the exact same facts before another arbitrator. And that arbitrator will say, person B is completely in the right. You know, and you look at it, you look at both of them, and you think, how on earth is this possible? And it's possible because the arbitrators are different people and they have the sole authority to make the decision. Sometimes they make what you consider to be good, honest and straightforward decisions. Even if they don't go, you know, sometimes they make decisions where even if they don't go your way, you're like, okay, you know, I get it. There's other times where they make decisions that are so 
obviously and completely wrong that you find yourself discussing what on earth got into them, you know, why they are so ludicrously biased against this person or this situation. Sometimes you can figure out the reason, sometimes you can't. But the point is that the fact that one person happened to uh, have a certain decision go their way in one arbitration means absolutely nothing whatsoever to what's going to happen in the other arbitration. In fact, we have seen where uh, a decision has been made in one arbitration and the other side tries to bring it into a different arbitration. And in every single case, the judge has said, no, I'm not even going to look at it. And so you just can't, um, anybody who is talking about, oh, well, it's going to go well for this person because it went well for this person, or it's going to go badly for this person because it went badly for that person. They have no idea what they're talking about. None whatsoever. And so this is why they have what's called consolidation and they have coordination. Yeah, Dayton makes a good point. Don't people know what arbitrary means? Exactly. Arbitration is arbitrary. There's no rhyme or rule to it. Um, and in fact, in some cases, you can actually correctly anticipate what kind of decision the arbitrator is going to make based on what you know about the arbitrator. You know, there are certain arbitrators, for example, that always want to avoid making a decision that will be decisive. So for example, um, Jams has a rule that says if you don't uh, if you don't uh, submit a response within seven days, you don't get to um, actually make a response. Uh, you, it's just assumed that you reject what the other person said. You can't you can't bring up your own positive case. You just have a negative case against what they said. Th this is right in the rules. Very straightforward. And there are certain judges, arbitrators, I should say. There are certain arbitrators that you absolutely know that they're simply going to ignore that rule. You know, they, they, they always say, well, uh, you know, the rule, the rule is cor correct, but I'm going to, you know, they, they, they broke the rule. Your citation of, of the rule is correct, but, but I'm going to allow it. And what's really funny is that we've actually built a whole collection of rulings on similar issues and the reasons that they give for those rulings. And they have nothing in common. You know, one person will tell you, uh, well, you didn't understand the rule. The rule doesn't mean that. Um, the fact that it says they may respond means within seven days means that they can respond whenever. Another judge will say, well, you're absolutely right, but I don't see any harm, so I'm going to allow it. Another judge will say, well, uh, the rules are liberal and permissive in practice. And so, same issue, I mean, exact same issue. There's a seven day deadline and the other party missed it. Well, for whatever reason, most arbitrators are going to just ignore the, the deadline. They almost always ignore the deadline. 
but of course they have to give a reason for it. And so they just make up some stupid reason most of the time. And those reasons are entirely different. This is just something that you have to deal with. You know, and, and so there are certain issues like that, we call them procedural issues, where you get a pretty good sense from the judge very early on whether they give a damn about procedure or not. Most of them don't. Most of them completely ignore procedure. It's annoying, but that's how it is. So how can we be confident about winning in certain circumstances then, given this? Well, there's a reason. Because what most of the arbitrators do is they weigh the narrative that one party brings and they weigh the part of the narrative that the other party brings. And this is where things become more predictable. Because on the procedural stuff, eh, you know, the arbitrator can do anything. But what they very seldom do is accept a narrative that has a provably false basis. Okay, they, they also don't like narratives that depend upon abstract thinking. Anytime you have to you know, lead them through a logical train of thought, you're, you're in trouble. And so that's why it's so interesting to see the kind of stuff that Patreon says here in this statement that they released. Let me, let me draw your attention to this part. We filed a lawsuit to bring some frivolous arbitrations into court because these claims should be decided in court under our terms of use. Um, well, that's one of the major features of their case against the Bears. Now, remember, their major, the major feature of their case against Owen was that they have the right to do, or they have the right to kick people off the platform based on the individual's behavior away from the platform. If you read any of the filings, you'll see that they complained about Owen's behavior on YouTube, Owen's behavior on Instagram, Owen's behavior on Twitter. But the reason that they are failing on all of those things is because the language in their contract doesn't actually say what they thought it said. They thought it said, well, we have the behavior, we have the right to uh, police your behavior off the platform because you know we're giving you money and so we have to be responsible for that. But what the language actually says is that they have the right to police the creations that you fund through Patreon. So, for example, if you say that I'm going to make a sculpture with the money that you give me on Patreon, and I take a picture of that sculpture and the sculpture is clearly in violation of their terms of use. Let's say it's a sculpture of a swastika uh, crushing George Floyd's head. That would be that would be something that would I think we could all agree would probably violate their terms of use somehow. And they put that up on they put that up on Instagram. In that case, they've got a point. They've got a right. They, they've got the right, at least according to the contract, to do that. The problem is that Patre your, your Patreon funding doesn't fund your Twitter account. Twitter's free. It doesn't fund your YouTube account. YouTube has its own monetization system. It doesn't fund your Facebook. 
count. So that's the fundamental problem that they have in the Owen arbitration. Does that mean that Owen's going to win? No. It doesn't mean that Owen's going to win because Owen needs to make the case about the tortious interference. Do, and that's all going to, all that's going to depend on, what that's going to hang on is whether the arbitrator agrees and believes that there is a separate contract between the creator and the patron. And so, um, yeah, slap weasel, just go ahead and, and nuke people that uh, keep going on about Beirut. I mean, who cares? <laughs> so, um, so that's the one. That's the one point. With, you know, with Owen's arbitration is going to depend on what the arbitrator thinks about the reality of the separate contract between the creator and the patron. Now, in the case of Indiegogo, that was open and shut. Indiegogo's language said specifically, you have a separate contract with your backers. We're not involved. We're not responsible. It's a separate, completely different contract that doesn't concern us. Patreon doesn't, doesn't put it that clearly, but they do uh, reject any responsibility for supplying the patrons with anything. And so that's, you know, I mean, this is one of those things where um, the arbitrators could go either way. Uh, no arbitrators uh, that I'm aware of has have ruled on tortious interference yet. Uh, I believe that um, I believe that Owens will probably be the first one to to rule on that. Um, so that's going to be very interesting. And and like I said, this is one of those things where it can go either way. Nobody can reasonably say um, that. Oh well, it's it's going to go this way. I mean. Anyone who says that doesn't know anything about arbitration, right? Again, so why can I be so confident about certain things? Because when they don't, when their narrative is not supported by the citations, by the language that they are talking about. And, and let's, let's remind you, they said, um, we filed a lawsuit to bring some frivolous arbitrations into court because these claims should be decided into court in court under our terms of use. Well, is that true? Let's look it up. Hang on a second here. I'm going to um, get to. Let's see. Where is this? Patreon. Okay, now these are their newest terms of use, right? So these are the brand new terms of use. There's no question that, I mean, this isn't the old ones. You know, these are actually newer than the version that they're trying to claim is, uh, is applicable, right? So, um, and I want you to see this. I'm gonna fire it up so you can actually see it. Um, I'll add the source page screen capture window capture there we are yes, I think so yep okay good so I'll increase the size so you can actually see it okay so to summarize if you have a problem please talk to us but you're limited in how you can resolve disputes you waive your right to trial by jury and your right to participate in a class at class action proceeding okay right there is your first warning sign because as we said as we've talked about before on this you cannot waive your right to trial by jury and you cannot waive your right to participate in a class action proceeding if you are a consumer who is stuck with a contract of adhesion, which this is. But that's not the point here, so let's let's focus on the important thing. They're saying that you have to go to court, right? So first they say, 
if the dispute cannot be resolved after you talk, talk with us, then it must be resolved by arbitration. Hmm. Well, that's a little confusing, isn't it? You know, why wouldn't they, why would they say that? Why would they say that it, they, they just said that it had to be brought in court, but uh, it's, now it says must be resolved by arbitration. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. But then what they try to do is they try to carve it out. So it goes on here. So it says, this clause does not limit either party's ability to file an action in a court with jurisdiction to seek injunctive or other equitable relief for disputes relating to intellectual property, proprietary data, or to enforce this dispute resolution clause, including your agreement not to assert claims related to the suspension or termination of another account. Okay, I want you to read that very carefully. Listen to this very carefully. This clause does not limit either party's ability to file an action. So you must arbitrate it, but this clause does not limit either party's ability to file an action. In any such action, the court rather than an arbitrator must decide whether such a claim is arbitrable and must decide whether the party is entitled to the requested injunctive or other equitable relief. Okay, are you spotting the problem there? Do you see the problem there yet? Maybe you don't. Um, so I will I will point it out to you. Um, what did I just do with it? Oh, I think I clicked away from it. Okay, there we go. Uh, I guess if I if I minimize it, then it disappears on the screen. Okay. This clause does not limit either party's ability to file an action. And if you file an action in any such action, the court rather than an arbitrator must decide blah, blah, blah. So what they're saying there is that either party has the right to file an action in court instead of arbitration for these different reasons. Do you see what I'm saying? It's an option. It is not a mandate. The change that they made didn't do what they thought it did. They made this change and they were, but they thought that it forced you to file a lawsuit. It doesn't. It simply does not limit your ability to file an action in court. Are you, are you grasping that yet? It's not about the contradiction. It's about the fact that they're flat out wrong. They're not trying to make a system where you, where you have to win twice. That's not correct. What they're doing is they are um, misinterpreting their own language. They gave you an option and the answer to all this nonsense about which terms of use apply. And, and it's actually kind of confusing because it's easy to get caught up in the arguments over the irrelevant stuff. You know, they say, well, they have to pay attention to our new terms of use. And we say, no, the date of accrual is based on when the, you know, based on this instead of that. And, and they're saying, well, no, but you have to use the new terms of use because it was effective two days before the filings, which, I mean, that isn't what they're saying is incorrect. But that doesn't matter because what it says is that you have an option to bring it in court or in arbitration. It's up to you. And so all every single claimant has to say is, I chose to bring it in arbitration, not in court. And so... Um, you know, yeah, the language is, is a little bit less than clear other than where it says you must go to arbitration for all disputes. But the point is, is that the carve out is an option. It is not a mandate. 
Now let's look at that statement again. We filed a lawsuit to bring some frivolous arbitrations into court. They're not frivolous, but we'll skip that for now. Because these claims should be decided in court under our terms of use. That's totally false. These claims can be decided in court if the person wanted to bring those claims in court. But the claimants instead chose to bring them in arbitration, which is their right. And so there's nothing to argue about. They have no case. They have absolutely no reason to complain about the arbitrations. So let's, let's uh, end this topic and we'll get to the super chats in a moment. Um, why do they care? Why were, did they go to all this trouble to get out of arbitration? Well, it's very simple. Uh, first of all, the people have been saying that, oh, you have to make uh, that, you know, they have to make all these payments up front and stuff. That's not really true. They do, but they're fairly small. The real reason is that the cost of an arbitration is on average around $25,000 a piece. So if you're looking at 250 arbitrations, you're looking at about $6.2 million on the basis, of, you know, just for the cost of the arbitration. That doesn't include the award, that doesn't include your lawyer's costs. So let's think about that. Let's, let's take a, a worst case, what, what should be a worst case scenario for Patreon. The 72 bears are going to win their arbitrations. I'll tell you that right now. Um, we know that they're going to win because they're amending their claims about the group action and Patreon's terms bar a group action. That's open and shut. Every single one of the 72 bears will win their arbitration. Uh, you know, it, it's like I said, there's there's areas where you go, oh, the arbitrator could go either way. There's areas where you say, eh, arbitrator is not likely to go our way. And there's areas where you're like, yeah, this one's this, this one's a dead cert. So the other 19 bears, they're kind of in, they're you know, they're kind of an Owen situation. Um, Torches interference. It's going to depend on the arbitrator. Could go that way, could go the other way. But so let's say that the a reasonable estimate, given the, the legal costs and all that for the bears, would be about 10 grand a piece. So they're going to win their arbitration. Let's assume they're going to get awarded something in the order of 10 grand a piece. So that's another $750,000. In Owen's arbitration, the damages, assuming that he wins, would probably be something that would give him um, about what he was making at his peak for the period of time that it was denied to him. So that would probably come to about $150,000. Now, is that all the costs? Well, no, because now we've heard about uh, Lauren Southern and her backers and some of these other folks. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical that, uh, you know, uh, Sargon or his followers are going to do anything. Um, I like Sargon. I uh, got a lot of respect for him from the Gamergate days, but, you know, neither he nor his backers, um, you know, are like the bears. So I'm, I'm dubious about that. But let's say, but there are a couple of people. There's a, uh, this anti-war guy. Um, he's pretty serious. His backers are pretty serious. Um, you know, Lauren has always had backers who are willing to, to show up. So let, let's say about 150 of these other backers file and so forth. Well, at 25,000 an arbitration, and uh, I say that, you know, as somebody who has direct experience of 
consumer arbitrations. Uh, that's that's about what it costs, more or less. You know, that's uh, the arbitrators run about seventy five hundred a day, and so when they schedule two days of hearings and you know three preliminary conferences plus the time they spend reading this stuff, you get to twenty five thousand relatively quickly. So, um, so anyhow, that would be with one hundred and fifty more claimants. That would be around uh, 3.7 million. So it's quite, you know, it's, we're, we're pushing, we're, we're over 10 million now. Are, but are we done? Well, no, because now we've got the lawyer's fees and lawyers are very expensive. Now, Patreon's lawyers are, you know, a, a boutique out of Oakland. Um, you know, they've got a, uh, they all used to be Oracle lawyers, and so they're obviously um, they're obviously you know reasonably good at what they do. Um, you know, you're not you're not going to be a uh, stupid incompetent working for Oracle very long. Um, but you know, they're certainly not on the level of say uh, an Oric, which is considered one of the best firms in Silicon Valley and one of the best firms in arbitration, right? So, um, but if you look at, at what they're, the costs of having the lawyers handle uh, on an order of 400 arbitrations, you're probably looking at around $6 million in legal fees. So if you, if you add all that up, it comes to about $17 million. Now, is that going to bankrupt Patreon? Of course not. They just got handed $60 million last July. Even if we assume that they've blown $1.5 million a month, even if they've blown $15 million in the past uh, year, they've still got $45 million in the bank. So they can afford this. You know, They can afford to uh, fight and even lose 400 arbitrations. But it's a question of how long are the investors going to tolerate the executives who have made these decisions? Now, you know, I've invested in companies before, and frankly, if I had a CEO who was permitting this kind of nonsense, you know, blowing as much as a third of my investment money on stuff that is not only not building the business, but actually getting in the way of building the business, you know, I would be, uh, I'd be getting rid of them. And certainly we saw that uh, there were a lot of changes at Indiegogo, you know, during and after uh, that process. Because fighting your customers may be good social justice, but it's terrible business. And so, um, so the point is, is that Patreon isn't going to go bankrupt from these arbitrations and from this lawsuit. But it is almost certainly going to lead to significant changes in the Patreon executive suite. And so that's what I would expect. And that's why I think it's going to be very interesting to pay attention to LinkedIn over the next three to six months to see what sort of changes are being made there because they almost certainly will be made because the decision to deplatform creators and then sue the patrons who showed up to support their creators is just a abysmally counterproductive, self-destructive thing to do. 
Um, Charlie wants to know what's the link with LinkedIn. Well, that's how you can see who works where. You know, we first learned about some of the changes at certain corporations because suddenly somebody who was, uh, you know, the vice president of this or the executive, uh, you know, executive manager of that, were suddenly at a new company. And so, um, you know, so th this is going to be a interesting and educational process. And, you know, we've all learned a lot along the way. You know, I now know far more about California law than I ever wanted to. You know, it's, it's funny how, you know, all the conversations now are, are, you know, dropping Peleg and Discover Bank and, you know, all kinds of other, uh, all kinds of other relative case law, you know, arguments about, well, but this, you know, Discover implies that. And yes, but you got to keep in mind that, but then there's, you know, there's Flatly <laughs> and so forth. So anyhow, um, but the point is, is that don't pay any attention to people who say they know exactly what's going to happen in arbitration, because in most cases, it's, it's just not, um, it's not even possible to say, even if you're completely familiar with every single step of the process along the way. So I'll check something here real quick. Okay. Um, let's see, is Patreon trying to bait me into logging in onto my account by stopping emails but charging me? Probably they've switched to a click wrap agreement uh, instead of their browse wrap uh, um, method that is, is not actually legal or not actually enforceable in California. But as I just demonstrated, it makes no difference. It makes absolutely no difference because the language does not force anyone into court. They're just absolutely and completely wrong about that. Anyhow, go ahead and with the super chats, if anybody has one, we can uh, spend about 10 minutes doing that. Is this how the corporocracy will die? No, the corporocracy is not going to die, but hopefully it's going to uh, improve itself a bit. You know, I would like to see, it, you know, some of these companies reverse their course before China eats their lunch. You know, I mean, right now, the, the, the sad thing is that the Chinese applications are actually less intrusive and uh, less focused on thought and speech policing than any of the US-based corporations. How crazy is that? I mean, that that would defy belief. Bobby Ticketbear says, is there a certain point where the Fed can no longer create debt? If yes, why? Uh, yes, when there are no more people able to take on the debt. That's called the pushing on a string point. Um, you know, you can't create debt without assigning it to a debtor. The optimistic pessimistic asks, is democracy a bigger threat to nationalism than monarchy? Uh, yes, unquestionably, especially if it's combined with open borders, mass immigration, and so forth. Um, if you are a member of this, uh, of this uh, dark stream on YouTube, uh, email me at voxday at gmail.com and I will add you to the pre-stream notifications. Can't the government always take on more debt? No. Uh, any soccer updates? Not really. Um, practice, is going, practice is going pretty well. Um, the, uh, you know, 
it, it's uh, nice to be back on the field. Um, I was a little frustrated at the most recent practice because I, I got one goal and two assists, but I should have had two more goals, but I just you know drilled it right at the goalie. <laughs> Um, so that was annoying. Have you, have you had any time lately to write a sea of skulls? Not a bit of it. None. Um, Zen Underground's loving the Forge of Tolkien on UATV. Good. In fact, uh, we need to get another one up there, um, tomorrow. So, um, so that's going well. Also, the new Hypergamous is out today, if you're interested. Dr. Azuma says, are you a fan of metal music? If so, you might enjoy the new Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal 2020 soundtracks. Mick Gordon is a monster composer. I've actually heard really good things about that. I've never listened to either of them. Uh, I'm not a big metal fan, um, but I do listen to a bit. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, certain guitarists, and uh, obviously I like Disturbed. I like baby metal, um, you know, but I'm, I'm not a I'm not a connoisseur. I'm not like listening to a lot of like Nightwish or anything like that. Um, <laughs> give them no quarter on the pitch. Hey, I am, I am, uh, yeah, Sabaton obviously is big. Sabbath, I mean, um, the, uh, I am ancient on the pitch. So I'm just, I'm just trying to, stay in shape and uh, keep my place on the on the team you know I'm I'm still uh, I'm still a starter somehow I'm not quite sure how I'm not quite, mostly I think because I always show up for practice and I'm very happy to come out and get substituted so um, but uh, but yeah I'm, I'm very fortunate that um, I'm still able to to play at my age <laughs> the uh, well, it's kind of funny because my captain, uh, you know, he's he's much taller than I am, and he hates it when I'm uh, guarding him on a, a, a corner kick because he's really strong in the air, and you know I have no hope of getting to the ball, so I basically just you know slam my body into his, <laughs> and he gets so angry at me, but. I think he actually likes it because he knows I do that in the game too. So, um, Oracle uh, Seneca Chief says Oracle lawyers. Now I despise them even more. That's funny. Well, the thing about the thing about the Who, I love the Who, no question. And by the Who, of course, I mean uh, Wolf Totem. Uh, this is Mongol Who, not the not the old Boomer Band, um, and. It's funny because they're not really metal at all, um, but still something about them just sounds more metal than than you know most heavy metal. So, um, Orc Slayer Bear uh, says that mouse cartoon on Webtoon is so good. Yeah, Lacey does a phenomenal job, and the thing that's really impressive is she's starting to do some writing as well. And even when she's not doing any of the writing, she often adds a little something extra. Like, for example, uh, the recent one where the Gamma Mouse is um, being hypercritical of all the, the female mice that walk by. Uh, you know, I wrote that whole thing, but the, the little bit with uh, the Apex Mouse and his girlfriend, uh, she just added that. You know, is a is a really nice touch that that really uh, made that a more effective cartoon, uh, just with a with a little bit of uh, extra graphics. Um, folk metal is still metal. Eh, okay, it's the growling voice that strikes people as metal. See, the voices are not what make music metal to me i mean you know baby metal is is much better metal than most and they have very very high-pitched young female voices so, well actually mouse yeah exactly um uh 
Unknown Sailor says, I've got Rebel Moon around here somewhere. That's funny. So, um, <laughs> Blurple Bear says, you're probably a bulldog out there. Um, uh, I'm actually pretty well known throughout the entire league for uh, basically being willing to do everything up to up to and including uh, cutting the other wing's throat in order to prevent him from scoring. Um, I think the, the last time that my guy scored a goal was, if I recall correctly, three years ago. And I was so furious because I actually got back to defend and I blocked the shot right in front of the, like inside the, the penalty spot. And the, the annoying thing is the way that I happened to block the shot, the ball basically stayed where it was. And both I and the goalie, our momentum carried us forward but because of the way his shot got blocked, it stopped his momentum. And so he was just standing in front of the empty net with the ball. So I was, I was pretty bitter about that. But say la vie. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a very low delta on my football team, my, my soccer team. Um, I play at a very high level. Um, there's a number, a number of formal, uh, former professionals on the team, uh, or on in the league, um, and actually, at, you know, like at our practice, two of our guys at practice today were wearing their jerseys from their when they played for their professional teams. Um, you know, I, I'm happy just to have a spot. Um, 2006-2012 Milan era summary. Uh, that would have to be its own stream. Uh, are you still one of the fastest ones on your team when you need to be? Uh, yes, but not by as much as I was three, four years ago. Um, you know, in fact, I was I was actually pretty pleased because I did manage to um, burn two or three people to you know at at the um, at the last practice and run down two people, but it's not as easy as it used to be. So I'm, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely slowing down a little, but I, I think I still have some room. So, um, well, here's the best thing about soccer, and this is something that you may not realize, but you burn an incredible number of calories. Um, I don't use a, a Fitbit anymore since, uh, not regularly since um, you know, Facebook or Google or whoever bought them. But I do put it on for uh, soccer practices and for some of the high intensity workouts that I do. And you know, it's pretty amazing to see that you can burn a thousand calories just in a, in a single practice. And you can get your 10,000 steps in, in a single practice. So, um, so anyhow, it's, uh, it's all good. <laughs> Anyhow, that's all we've got for tonight. So thanks for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you at the next dark stream. Uh, if you haven't signed up for unauthorized yet, I encourage you to do so. And we will, um, and Blurple Bear says, <laughs> towards the next time you guard a corner kick with no quarter. Thank you, I'll, uh, I'll let them know. I'm Vox Day. This is the Dark Stream. Christopher?